And now we'd like to welcome uh, those who are watching on the internet. It's good for you to be, good for us to know that you're there. And I trust that you find it's good to be with us as we continue this service here in Perry. If you're ever in the vicinity of Perry, do feel free and welcome to come and join us every Sunday, 10.30. It'd be great to see any others who want to move from the internet to the reality of being here. I'd like to ask Joan to come and bring to us a reading from Colossians. Morning, I'm reading from Colossians chapter 4, verses 7 to 18. Tychicus will tell you all the news about me. He is a dear brother, a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I am sending him to you the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. He is coming with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother, who is one of you. They will tell you everything that is happening here. My fellow prisoner, Aristarchus, sends you his greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. You have received instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. Jesus, who is called Justice, also sends greetings. These are the only Jews among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have proved a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. I vouch for him that he is working hard for you and for those at Laodicea and Hierapolis. Our dear friend Luke the doctor and Demas sends greetings. Give my greetings to the brothers and sisters at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. After this letter has been read to you, see that it is also read to the church of the Laodiceans and that you in turn read the letter from Laodicea. Tell Archippus, see to it that you complete the ministry you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you, and may God add a blessing to his word. Thank you, Joan. It was the 22nd of January, 1901. Now I realise that's before the time of most of us here, but uh, the 22nd of January, 1901 and a family gathered together on the Isle of Wight. It was the royal family and I wonder if anybody can guess what may be happening around about that time. The 22nd of January 1901 yeah, it was the day that Queen Victoria died and she died in her bed in her bedroom in Osborne House on the Isle of Wight. There's a family gathering, but it wasn't a one day gathering. There was more to it than that because they were so concerned about the loss of Victoria that they made a bronze plaque, went above the bed. And they created an altar, which they placed in the same room. And for 50 years, they treated that room as a shrine, as they remembered. And every time the family was on the Isle of Wight, they went to that room. And they remembered, they looked back and remembered the things that related to Queen Victoria. And there at Cow's Week particularly, they would come over for 50 years, a shrine.
50 years. I guess that takes us up to around about the time after the war and when our present queen came to the throne. But 50 years, one room, a shrine to the past. But you know, when Paul is writing to this letter to the Colossians, you know, we've been looking through this letter to the Colossians, and here we are on that last chapter, when we look to it, and we see that as Paul is giving his final greetings, as he gives those final greetings, you know, he's speaking to them about things that are important for the present and for the future. Now, Paul is in the latter part of his life. He's there imprisoned in Rome. He's going to be executed. But here he's talking about, this is what lies ahead, this is what, how you should be. And it isn't about a shrine. It's about how we can live our best for our Lord. How do we live our best? How do we live our best for the Lord? number of things that Paul would have mentioned, and here is one of them. Faithfulness. Faithfulness. I guess in a sense they were faithful to Queen Victoria coming back, but not really the kind of faithfulness that Paul would have been speaking of here. What a faithfulness they had. Tychicus will tell you all the news about me. He is a dear brother, a faithful minister, and a fellow servant in the Lord. I'm sending him to you for the express purpose you may know our circumstances. Let me encourage your hearts. He's coming with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother, who is one of you. They will tell you everything that's happening here. So there is that expression. I want you to remember your faithfulness. I want you to remember your faithfulness. I'm writing in the midst of imprisonment. I'm writing without any idea how long that lies ahead for me. But I want to encourage you, whether I'm here or whether I'm somewhere else, whether I'm here or whether I'm with the Lord, be faithful. Faithful. There's a faithfulness in ministry. He speaks about Tychicus, who, who is a dear brother, a faithful minister, and a fellow servant in the Lord. And in the faithfulness, God's called us to minister. God's called each one of us to minister. And I think it's quite interesting. He doesn't just say about ministry. He doesn't just talk about being a minister, but a fellow servant in the Lord. Why do I find that interesting? I find it interesting because... Ministry literally means serving. To be a minister literally means to be a servant. It's not something that we put on a pedestal. To be a servant. But to be a servant of the Lord. To be God's servant. To know that humility before him. And therein is the, is, is the essence of the faithfulness we need to know. That we are prepared not to look at ways in which we are on a pedestal, preaching the word or whatever we may be doing, but to be there at the lowest point. For the only one that should be on the pedestal is our Lord. The only one that needs and should be raised up in our presence is our Lord. We look unto him who is the author and the finisher of our faith. We look up unto him and we have confidence. He is the God we would serve. He is the God we should serve. Now, I don't know what you may see as your ministry, but every one of us has been called into a ministry. Uh, and we use that word minister with a capital M, and we apply it to one person, whether they got the shirt back to front or not. And uh, there's a minister. But you know, as Baptists, do we not believe in the ministry of all believers? Our ministry will be different. But it's a ministry nevertheless. The ministry not necessarily standing here, preaching. 
Not necessarily standing here reading God's word. But to be there wherever it is that God's given the gifts for us to use and to use them. Paul speaks in other places about the gifts of the Spirit. Some wonderful gifts, isn't there? Some wonderful gifts. How many of us perhaps would major on, on the, the very public kind of gifts of the Spirit? They seem to be a bit more glorifying for ourselves. We enjoy that. We perhaps enjoy the attention. But in the list of the gifts of the Spirit also are things like the gift of helps. Yeah, Paul lists that as a spiritual gift. The gift of administration. And Paul lists that as a spiritual gift. It's all there. Each one of us has a ministry of some kind or, or another. C.S. Lewis wrote a book and uh, in this book he gave an illustration of a lady who had put a sign in front of her kitchen sink. And the sign of the kitchen sink said, Divine worship is carried out here three times daily. <laughs> Interesting, isn't it? She was ministering. She was serving. And whether you're male or female, the same applies for us. Divine worship carried out here three times daily. And there at that kitchen sink, no doubt, came the expressions of her heart. Faithfully serving. Faithfully worshipping. Faithfully giving her all. Giving her all. She was serving as she was serving her Lord. She was serving as if it was her Lord she was giving her everything to. Faithfulness. Faithfulness. And in the midst of that faithfulness comes encouragement. I am sending him, that's Tychicus, I am sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. So in the faithfulness, uh, you know, there's one thing that we can see that God can use within us. Wherever we are, and whatever our physical ability may or may not be, we can use that gift of encouragement. You know, we may not be able to do the things that we did when we were 20 years old. Maybe we just can't get up out of our seat at some point in our lives. We can't walk from here to there. But while we're sitting down, we can be the encourager to somebody else that's beside us. What a ministry God's got there. To be the encourager. To be the encourager. Barnabas uh, had that gift, didn't he? The son of encouragement is what his main name literally means. A son of encouragement. And what a gift he had as he encouraged those around him. Everybody looked to him. He said, here is the one who deserves that nickname to be the son of encouragement. We've known his encouragement in our heart. We've known it in our lives. Oh, that we could have that same nickname. To know that encouragement. To share that encouragement. To give that encouragement to those who meet wherever we may be. Faithfulness. And therein is not merely that dark shrine. But therein is the brightness and the glory of a Lord who's leading us on. That we might be faithful to him, knowing his faithfulness to us. But secondly, secondly, he speaks not only about faithfulness, but he speaks about fellowship. Fellowship. To see how he accepts. He accepts others as brothers. As brothers. That's important. 
He's coming with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother, who is one of you. Does Onesimus, does that name mean anything? Does that kind of ring any bells for us? Onesimus? Read the book of Philemon sometime when you get home. And you'll find there's an Onesimus there. And Onesimus was there. Onesimus, the man, young man, who fled away from where he was. Left, he was a slave. And uh, he decided he was going to run away. And uh, it would look as if that he misbehaved before he actually did so. So he ran off. And he went from one village to another to another until eventually reached Rome. And there in Rome, he came to faith. In Rome, he came to trust Jesus as his saviour. Yeah, this Onesimus, who really didn't do too well as a young person, probably like, probably like us, didn't do too well as a young person, but as he made his way to Rome, he met with Christians and there he trusted Jesus as his saviour. And somewhere along the line, he met up with Paul. And he would meet with Paul. Paul was under house arrest. And uh, so as he's in a house, he could go in and meet with Paul, even though he's a prisoner. And as they talked together, so Onesimus would have shared his story. He would have shared the reality of how... Jesus had forgiven him. Jesus had brought a change in his life. Yet, what about Philemon, the one that he had wronged? What about Philemon? And at this point, Paul says, I know Philemon. He's a friend of mine. And if you go back, I'll write a letter of commendation that you can take with you. I'll write it and you can give it to him and uh, we'll see. Maybe my backing will support you in your chance of being reconciled with him. This is the character who Paul is saying, our faithful and dear brother. He's changed. He's accepted him as being one of them. He's accepted him as a brother in the Lord. And whatever has been in the past is in the past. What is important is the present. And to know here is the gift. In a wonderful English language, the present, it's a gift. But a gift for today is the, is the, is the Jesus who says, I will change your life. I can change your life in ways that no one else could ever do. You know, whatever may be our past, and we've all got a past, haven't we? Every one of us. Well, not everybody knows about it, but we know we've got a past. Every one of us has got a past. And when we've trusted Jesus as our Saviour, as our Lord, he has changed us, he's made us new, and we are accepted as brothers. So whatever may be in the past, it's gone. It's gone. Look to the present and respect the gift our Lord's given of new life. New life. I'm just thinking as, uh, as I'm talking, I'm thinking about when Jesus met up with a woman by the well. Do you remember the story there? It's there in John chapter 4. And in the fourth verse, in the fourth verse, we see these words. That Jesus had to go through Samaria. Jesus had to go through Samaria. And you think, hang on a minute, that sounds so cold, so heartless. Uh, Jesus only went to Samaria because he had to. Because it was on the route. He wouldn't have gone there otherwise. Gee, that doesn't sound like my Jesus. Jesus had to go through Samaria. And then when you think it through, Maybe it isn't so cold and heartless. Because, you know, the Jews and the Samaritans just didn't meet. You know, it's, uh, 
You know, it's like, like the Ukrainians and Russians meeting up at the moment. It doesn't happen. You don't go through Samaria if you're a Jew. Unless you've got something to do when you're there. And so it isn't just a matter of convenience. It wasn't that Jesus had to go through Samaria because it was on the route. Jesus had to go through Samaria because there was a woman in need of hearing there is hope. There was a woman who was sat by the well needing to have Jesus there saying there is hope even for you. Even for you. She discovered that hope. She was a changed person. She was at the well on her own at the hottest time of the day. Now the women don't do that normally, not in those parts of the world. They'll go early in the morning because early in the morning they can meet up with others and there they can, they can talk and share all the latest news, the latest gossip, but they can help each other. Bring in the water out of the well. She didn't. She didn't go with the others. She went where no one else was likely to be there. Why? Because she was an outcast in society. You know, when Jesus is talking with her and talks about her husband, she says, I haven't got a husband. Jesus says, you've said right. You've said right. You've had five husbands. And the one you're living with now, the man you're living with now, he's not really your husband. So you said right. And you know, in the society of that time, she would have been an outcast. They wouldn't want anything to do with her. So rather than risk the condemnation, she went when no one else would be there. After a time with Jesus, here was that changed character, went down into the village and said, come meet a man who knows everything about me. Everything about me. Well, perhaps we would be tempted if we were them. We might say, yeah, we know all about you. That's why you have to go to the well on your own. But they didn't say that. Come see a man who knows everything about me. And so they came with her. There was something different about her, something changed. They wanted to find out what it was that changed this woman, the outcast, into the, the woman who was now outgoing for Jesus. She had changed and she could be accepted in society. It didn't matter about the past. It's gone. It's gone. And we know that fellowship. We can know that fellowship because of what Jesus has done and no other reason. Not because of what we've done, but what our Lord has done for us. And thirdly, we need to remember forgiveness. Forgiveness. Paul says, my fellow prisoner Aristarchus sends you his greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. Forgiveness. Mark's, Mark's a character who they... Um, he, he kind of got, he was a young person, kind of got homesick, I think. And he couldn't take the pace of the missionary journeys. But here he is, Mark. And then there's Demas, if you read on later on. It talks about Demas. Do you know another passage where Paul refers to Demas, who's forsaken him for the love of this world. Yet they're here together. Forgiveness has taken place. Forgiveness has taken place. It's a reconciliation. A reconciliation. And they had a choice. They had a choice. They could have stayed or they could have strayed. Yeah, there was a time when they strayed. But now is the opportunity to change and to stay here and to be a part of the praying and to be a part of the support network God had set up. Forgiveness. They were reconciled. They were reconciled. You know, 
we need to reconcile with each other as well as being reconciled with Jesus. That's important. That's important. If we want to know, if we know about the forgiveness Jesus has given, then we've got a Lord who says, come on, uh, I want you to love each other. I want you to love each other. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, that you've got love one for another. So there is that, as, he, as Jesus has forgiven, forgiven us, uh, maybe we need to forgive each other. Whatever it is, whatever it is, that we might know what it is to be reconciled together, brought together, and in that reconciliation, whatever may be, we now know we can give a recommendation, a recommendation to others. Aristarchus sends his greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, You've received instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. Welcome him. What a, what a recommendation. Welcome him. Welcome him. Take him in as one. Trust him. Whatever may have happened before, trust him. And be resigned to our common goal. And that common goal is to follow Jesus. To follow Jesus. And we can speak about the faithfulness. We can speak about the fellowship. But in our common goal, is it not to know Jesus? Is it not to share Jesus? And to be able to say, Jesus, I want to trust you as my Saviour. I want to trust you as my Lord. I want to trust you wholly and completely. I want to give my life to Jesus. It's only as we give our lives to Jesus that we can come to that point of knowing what it is to know the fellowship together, faithfully serving the one who faithfully, faithfully gave his everything for us. For us. And maybe times we think, well, hang on, I don't know that I'm worthy of it all. And the reality is we probably are not worthy I'm not. So we're probably not worthy. But isn't it wonderful? That in our unworthiness, Jesus made us worthy. Isn't it wonderful that we are speaking of a Lord who ch exchanged our sinful ranks for his robe of righteousness? I can't do it for my sake. I can't do it in my own ability. But Jesus does. He changes our sinful ranks and gives to us in exchange a robe of righteousness. A robe of righteousness for each one of us. It's ours. He's given it to us. When we said, Jesus, my Lord, my God, I trust you as my seed. Let's spend a few moments in prayer. Let's pray. <coughs> Blessed Lord and Heavenly Father, thank you for your faithfulness to us. Thank you, Lord, that we can know fellowship with you. But thank you that it's ours when we come seeking forgiveness when we come giving our whole lives unto you, it's ours. Only because you've given it to us as a gift, as we humbly place ourselves at your feet. And so we pray this in your namesake. Amen. 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 Well... Thank you to those who have been with us on the internet. It's good that we've been able to share this time together. Look forward to sharing with you another time.